Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. A public health emergency in the U.S. as monkeypox cases rise in our community. Metro Health is giving you details. What to know about vaccines and how long it takes for monkeypox symptoms to appear. Coming up. Also, a standoff with San Antonio police continues even at this hour. Our crews are on the scene tonight. Who officers say they're hoping to take into custody peacefully? Plus, we're taking a closer look at those energy bills, where those extra costs are coming from, and what you need to know about the 20 degree rule. But first. Now the U.S. is calling monkeypox a public health emergency. That's nearly two weeks after the World Health Organization sent out its own alert. Right now, 16 cases have been confirmed in San Antonio. In Austin, there are as many as 46. More than 7,100 cases have been reported across the U.S. And now that the White House has made that public health declaration, it basically frees up federal money to, and resources to help fight the virus. But there is a problem there aren't enough vaccines for everyone. And that's why Metro Health is offering you another way to protect yourself. The night team's Camelia Juarez has the facts that you need to know. And so it's very important to attend this, to understand how, what it is and how it is transmitted so you can take the prevention strategies. Metro Health is separating fact from fiction about the newest public health emergency. Dr. Anita Curion says the virus does not spread through casual contact like public restrooms or touching a doorknob. But the most, the primary driver of this infection is coming in close, direct, intimate skin to skin contact with somebody who has a rash, a monkeypox rash. Those who are infected may experience flu like symptoms one to three weeks after exposure. After two to four weeks, a rash will form along with painful lesions like the ones shown here. The majority of cases are among gay and bisexual men, but Curion says the virus does not discriminate. I cannot emphasize this enough that any person, regardless of their gender identity or sexual orientation can acquire and transmit the disease if you come in close contact with somebody who has monkeypox. Curion says San Antonio has received enough vaccine to treat 500 people, but Metro Health is hopeful it will get more. Those who are infected, exposed, or have a compromised immune system will have priority. The vaccines are pretty limited at this time, so it's very important that uh, folks adhere to the prevention strategies uh, that we've been recommending. And this is all happening as kids get ready to go back to school. But Dr. Kirion says the risk for children is low and her advice to everybody else is to avoid contact, close, intimate contact with someone who may have a rash or lesion. And if you missed today's forum, there will be another one at Luther's Cafe on August 18th. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. Camilla, Camilla, thank you. This is a story we're going to continue to track online and also on KSAT.com. If you missed tonight's forum, you can still watch it. We've streamed it for you on KSAT.com. You see this article on your screen? Just look for it when you go to our website. And now we're going to bring you a live picture. San Antonio police have been in a standoff with a man in a Northside apartment for 23 hours. Now this picture here doesn't really show you much because it's an active scene and this right here is as close as we're allowed to be. It's happening at the Agora Stone Oak apartments. Now officers say that standoff began when they got a tip that a wanted murder suspect was at one of those apartments. That was around 11 o'clock last night. The SWAT team, negotiators, they're on the scene. Police say there's no threat to the public. Of course, we'll continue to bring you updates. The man who took his girlfriend's life has now learned his own fate. Jorge Izquierdo got a 50 year sentence for murdering 27 year old Cora Nickel. He left her body in a pool of blood for the couple's two daughters to find the next day. The murder happened in August of 2020. Police later found Izquierdo in California after leaving his car and his car keys at Nickel's home. Surveillance video also placed him at the home the night that Nickel was murdered. Izquierdo has to serve half of his 50-year sentence before he's eligible for parole. 
And now to an update in a legal battle out of Uvalde. In a hearing today, State Senator Roland Gutierrez pressed DPS for more information about how that agency responded the day of the shooting at Rob Elementary. Now, Gutierrez says that he hasn't even been able to get a policy manual from DPS. He also says that DPS is holding on to video from 34 other cameras that show what happened the day of that shooting. I'm asking to find out why there was a DPS Texas Ranger walking around that building on the phone. I want to know who he was talking to, who was giving him orders, and who gave him the order to not go. Whoever he was talking to, why didn't they tell him, go get 10 of our guys and charge that door right now? Now, Senator Gutierrez also pressed the Uvalde District Attorney, Christina Busby, on whether she ordered DPS to not release records in the investigation. Now, she said that she's asked anyone who was willing to listen to her to refrain from doing so. She says she doesn't want people to change their stories, lawyer up, and stop cooperating. Gutierrez, by the way, is hoping to hear an update next week. He's accused of working with a driver who had dozens of dead migrants in the back of a hot 18-wheeler. And in today's hearing, Christian Martinez pleaded not guilty to charges related to that migrant tragedy in San Antonio. Martinez, as well as Omero Zamorano, were indicted in July after the deaths of 33, 53 people, excuse me, who were in the back of that sweltering big rig. If they're convicted, both of those men could face the death penalty. And just today, a freight trailer with migrants was found abandoned in the Mexican state of Veracruz. Authorities are saying that at least 94 migrants bashed holes into that container to escape. People nearby heard that noise and then helped to open up that container. And, you know, just this week, investigators tracked down a smuggling ring to the mountains of Guatemala. Felipe Diego Alonso and others were arrested as a part of the U.S. investigation. U.S. attorneys are saying that they were linked to the death of a migrant woman who died in Odessa. Her body was left on the side of the road last year. As repeatedly demonstrated, smugglers do not care whether those they conduct business with live or die only that the smuggler gets paid. So those four men are going to be extradited to the U.S. and if convicted, they could face life in prison. They're going to be the first extraditions from Guatemala for human smuggling. In total, authorities arrested 19 alleged members of the smuggling ring. Now here at home, a new version of a plan to bring bike lanes to Broadway, not up to part with the state. Voters approved a plan to redevelop the corridor as part of a bond, but here's the thing. The state still owns a section of Broadway near the Pearl up towards the University of the Incarnate Word. The city prepared a new version of plans that would cut some lanes but still allow traffic to flow more efficiently. But TxDOT wasn't happy. It wants to keep six lanes along Broadway and says that its staff is going to work on a new plan. So we're going to see what they come up with. New tonight, not what you want to hear, but live roaches in the kitchen, unapproved ice for sale. Those are just a few of the violations topping the list of recent restaurant inspections. The night team's Tim Kerber takes us behind the kitchen door. Our first stop this week is the Picnic Foods located in the 500 block of Ruiz Street. 11 repeat violations helping bring down their score to a 73. The health inspector found improperly labeled bags of ice for sale. They were bagging up the unapproved ice on site without the proper license. A microwave that was rusted on the inside was taken out of service and replaced. There were live roaches in the kitchen and the ceiling tiles above the kitchen were peeling paint. <laughs> Maria's Cafe number one in the 1400 block of Couples Road earned a 75 on their recent inspection. When the inspector visited on July 1st, they found a bin of prepared chicken with a use-by date of June 24th. The chicken was thrown out. There was old food debris, including a foil-wrapped taco on the floor behind the cook's cold unit. A container of sugar was being stored on the floor, and an employee was seen touching customers' prepared tacos with bare hands. Eleven violations were corrected during the inspection. <laughs> Finally, Cafe San Luis, located in the 1600 block of Castroville Road, scored an 82. Meat was discovered thawing in a sink at room temperature. It was showing a temp of 68. Coffee creamer that should have been refrigerated was temped at 67. Both items should be 41 degrees or less. Food in a freezer was stored under a fan that was leaking fluid onto that food. 
There were also ice stalactites forming on the shelves. Staff corrected seven violations during their inspection. That's what's behind the kitchen door. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Uh, coming up, it's routine. The more that we see triple digit heat, the more that you're asked to conserve, right? CPS Energy wants you to conserve power between 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. And the thing is that dishwashers and washing machines aren't the only appliances that you have to consider. So tonight we're taking a look at the 20 degree rule and what it means for your AC. Plus, we're going to break down those rising costs in your electric bill. So stick around. It's next on the Nightbeat. Definitely not a fun conversation to talk about, but we've all seen costs go up this summer. One man says that he's been tracking his electric bill and he noticed something. It's up 80 bucks compared to last year. So what's changed? The night team's Patty Santos talks to CPS Energy to break down that bill. Usually our bill is between 150 to $200 a month. Um, you know, we're a family of four, so a lot of us are in and out of the home. Pablo Calvo says his bill in June was more than $370. CPS Energy CFO Corey Kaczynski says bills were averaging $225 in June. And that's about 70 almost $80 higher than what it was a, a year ago. About 45% of the increase on bills, he says, is driven by fuel costs alone. The other big driver is going to be usage. Um, again, for an average customer, that that's close to I mean, the high 40s as well. That was about $37, $38 of, of that increase. The rest on your bill includes roughly a $4 rate increase that started in March and about $1.50 for fuel adjustment costs related to the 2021 winter storm, as well as state regulatory charges. Bottom line, he says customers are using more kilowatts during peak hours to cool down and it's adding up. The real struggle I think that folks are seeing is when it's 105 outside, your AC unit can only cool your home down to about 20 degrees, you know, cooler from the outside. Yeah, again, so when it's 100 degrees, you can't cool your home more than uh, 80 degrees. So he suggests that you use fans. And also another way to save, he says, is during peak hours, limit the number of heavy appliances that you're using, like uh, dishwashers. And if you're still having issues paying your bills, there are programs that could help. Stephanie. Patty, thank you. Now for a look at your headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. Police say they were responding to a fight when emotions boiled over. Officers are saying that this man, Aaron Lee Fisher, is accused of shooting and killing the man that he was arguing with. It's a story that we brought to you as breaking news last night. This shooting happened on Ike Street near Ike Street, excuse me, near Palo Alto Road on the city's southwest side yesterday. Police haven't yet said what that argument was over. We also don't know the victim's name. Her death sparked months of protests, and now today, four officers are facing federal charges in the botched raid on Breonna Taylor's home. Louisville police officers shot that 26-year-old six times back in 2020. Police knocked down her door while executing a search warrant, and gunfire rang out. The U.S. Attorney General says that police used false information to get that warrant. Four current and former Louisville police officers face charges, including unlawful conspiracy, use of force, and obstruction of justice. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones is going to have to pay more than $4 million to the parents of a mass shooting victim. A jury in, audit in Austin returned that verdict today. The lawsuit centers around his false claims that the Sandy, Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting was a hoax. He said so on his show numerous times. Yesterday, he said that he now knows the shooting was real. Today's ruling, though, is not going to be the last. The Austin jury has still to decide how much Jones has to pay in punitive damages to Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. And now we bring you some breaking news right here. We're getting live pictures from Sky 12 on the south side of the county. This is right near I-37 Mathis Road. Deputies say they're responding to a one vehicle rollover near the Bear County and Atascosa County line. To see all those lines, uh, all those traffic lights, that's traffic. Lots and lots of traffic. Now we're being told the driver was airlifted to the hospital and deputies are just asking you to avoid this area because the northbound lanes of I-37 is going to be shut down for several hours. So again, there was a rollover crash on I-37 and Mathis. They airlifted someone to a hospital and that's the reason for all that traffic back up there. So just 
try to find an alternate route if that's something that you're looking to get to um, in the next few hours or if it's tomorrow morning. Who knows how long it's going to take to clear, but watch our Stephen Cavazos on um, GMSA. All right, so we have a, a, another live shot right now, our south side city cam. Temperatures right now 88 degrees, and what we want, we're not, we're probably not going to get rain, but some moisture, maybe? Well, there's a, there's a chance. It's just not a great chance, and that's the problem. But at this point, we'll take anything. And, you know, we just slipped below 90 degrees. It has been a really hot day. Take a look at the highs. We tied a record today. 103 here in San Antonio, 106 in Pleasanton. Del Rio also set a record with a high temperature of 105. Boy, it was very hot. We'll see temperatures get a little bit cooler tomorrow as some added moisture works into the area. By the way, 55 days now, 100 or above. We are closing in on those records, and it's almost inevitable at this point that we're going to surpass, surpass 2011 and 2009. The way things are looking outside right now, 89 degrees at the airport, partly cloudy. Dew point has jumped back up to 70. It feels like 94 with a good southeasterly breeze at 17 miles per hour. Still 91 in Hondo, 93 in Uvalde, 86 Gonzales, 82 down there in Beeville. And temperatures are right around 90 degrees here in Bear County at this hour. Dew points have jumped back up just within the last few hours with those southerly winds bringing in higher dew points right now again 70 at the airport that makes it feel like 94 we still have heat indices close to 97 right now in castroville so not a lot of relief at least at this hour and we look at the wind gusts gusting out at 28 miles per hour at the airport we'll see some gusty winds overnight more winds tomorrow so there is still a fire threat on your friday but a little bit more humidity helps us out some, so it's not as high as it has been the last couple days. Forecast temperature tomorrow, right around 100 here in town. 96 Fair Oaks Ranch, 99 Floresville, 98 in Gonzales. A little cooler across our eastern counties because we are expecting some deeper moisture to work in. Radar and satellite pictures shows we do have a few showers out in the Gulf of Mexico. That's that deeper moisture I'm talking about. So to rise to our eastern counties tomorrow, this orange color represents that deeper moisture. And then by Saturday, it's moving further west, and I think that gives us a little better chance for rain. Here's a look at the computer models, and it does show an isolated shower or storm tomorrow east of I-35. We'll put in a 10% chance here in San Antonio. And then by Saturday, again, a little better chance of a downpour, 20%. It'll be hit or miss. Not everyone is going to get rain, but at least there is a little bit in the forecast. And very quickly, we've got to talk about the hurricane season. NOAA put out a new forecast today, or at least updated their forecast. Basically stays the same. They're still calling for an above average season, 14 to 20 name storms, six to 10 hurricanes, and three to five major hurricanes. With that being said, nothing out there. Things are still very quiet. Looks like the Saharan dust is still suppressing a lot of that development. We are not expecting development over the next five days. You can see where that dust is. There are a couple waves coming off the coast of Africa. We'll see what happens there. But again, as of right now, still pretty quiet out there. Here's our forecast. 98 tomorrow, 20 or uh, 100 tomorrow, 10% chance of rain. 98 on Saturday, 20% chance of rain. A few coastal showers Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. We're back in the triple digits again, and this heat's not letting up, but at least there is a rain chance next couple days. I just wish those coastal showers would move a little bit to the west. Just I know. a little bit. So little close. Bit. Yes. Yeah. All right, Justin, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're going to head on over to California, where our very good friend Greg Simmons has been for two weeks, and we miss you over here, but I know you're having fun. And miss you too. Dak Prescott is saying something about a, a young wide receiver from San Antonio. That's right, because of the injury to James Washington, a lot of the young wide receivers are getting actually more reps with Dak, and he's caught the eye of Dak Prescott, the star quarterback. When we come back, you'll hear from the Cowboys quarterback about the young man named Dennis Houston. And also when we come back, how about D-Law? In other words, Demarcus Lawrence. After missing half of last season, is he ready to go this year? Coming up. Camping with KZ, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our live coverage of the Dallas Cowboys training camp here in Oxnard, California. Another great day on the field for Dak Prescott today. Just check out this near length of the field bomb to C.D. Lamb right in the breadbasket and in stride for the catch. But ever since the foot injury to James Washington on a similar route, the Cowboys have been very careful. That has allowed young receivers in camp to shine, including San Antonio's own Dennis Houston out of Warren High School, who's turning heads of not just Dak, but C.D. Lamb, head coach Mike McCarthy, and offensive coordinator Kellen Moore taking advantage of his opportunities.
A lot of young guys have stepped up. Um, just to say one would be cheating the others, but obviously Dennis Houston, uh, Tolbert, uh, two just to start off who've been in there and taking one reps, uh, stepping up when, when you're asking, hey, give us an X or give us a Z. Uh, they're coming in just trying to play whatever position, be available to the offense in whichever way they can. And that's how you, that's how you get on the field is by doing as many things as you can and doing them at a high level. And that's what these young guys are doing right now. That's great to hear DeMarcus Lawrence is back after missing almost half of last season, of course, after he broke a bone in his foot in practice after game one of the season. Now he is back reporting to training camp, healthy, wealthy, and wise. I feel like it's different because I got a training camp. You know, uh, it's been a long time, you know, since I had a training camp. So, you know, just truly blessed. Uh, I feel like, you know, with the training camp, it, it uh, propelled me to the season, you know, for the season that I'm type, trying to have. DeMarcus Lawrence is coming off a frustrating year. After week one, he broke his fifth metatarsal or pinky toe in practice. Following surgery wasn't activated until December. Still, he managed to score three sacks, two forced fumbles and 21 tackles. Truly excited, truly happy um you know you know to be out here for training camp to be to be able to come out here with the team and now i'm ready to you know learn from it and get better now getting ready to start his ninth season in a cowboys uniform tank is part of a defense that is now the strength of the team you know y'all say that every year you know <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh the defense always have to you know try to step up to compete with the offense but you know truly um in my nature um i feel like it goes hand in hand in hand um you know, our defense uh, had a wonderful year last year in uh, turnovers and, you know, getting the offense extra opportunities to score. Um, but, you know, um, I feel like it's going to go hand in hand again this year. But can DeMarcus return to the form that earned him two Pro Bowl appearances and one second team All Pro with 321 combined tackles, 48 and a half sacks, 17 forced fumbles with six recoveries, and two interceptions in his career as a Cowboy? This late in my career, you know, uh, you know, it's a blessing that I make the Pro Bowl. But at the end of the day, it's all about team wins and uh, making sure we make it to the Super Bowl. So my mind is focused on the end goal. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give it all I can. Uh, you know, I let my talent speak for itself but you know if I go out and you know play a full season I, no question I should have made the Pro Bowl. Have people forgotten about you at all? It don't matter what they think it matters what I do. There you go. The Texans continue their training camp, but in the heat and humidity of Houston, and that includes defensive end Jerry Hughes, who was signed this offseason. Hughes admits his battle with the elements is magnified when he has to go up against one of the best left tackles in the NFL, Larry McTunzel. So how does he describe his one-on-one face-offs in the trenches with Tunzel? Intense. You know, uh, we haven't really been holding anything back. You know, the guy said once the pass come on, to show out and I think everybody in our room kind of took that personal and I think everybody in the uh, offensive line room took it as well you know we don't want to repeat the season that we had last year and so I think with uh, everybody understanding that in order for us to win up front in the trenches we got to dominate all right, another year here for a UTSA Roadrunner living the dream with an extra year of eligibility coming up The UTSA Roadrunners continue with their fall camp to get ready for their season opener on September the 3rd against Houston. Corey Mayfield is a fifth-year senior cornerback for the Roadrunners as after suiting up in all 14 games last season with two interceptions, one forced fumble, 37 tackles, and 34 solo stops. Five years goes by fast. Flew by, man. I remember getting thrown in that fire UAV yeah. game, man, in, in Birmingham. So, yeah, man, it's, it's flew by, man. I'm kind of... Uh, it's, it's a bittersweet feeling, man, you know, but hey, it's here, man. It is, and don't forget to join us on Sunday as Dak Prescott goes one-on-one -on -one with KSAT 12 Sports, answering questions about this coming season after a disappointing one and done in the playoffs. What does he think about the Cowboys hiring a mental health consultant? We'll have it all for you Sunday on Instant Replay right after the night beat. We'll be back tomorrow live starting at 5, live from the Cowboys training camp in California. Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. All right, look forward to seeing you then, Greg. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. It's been a pleasure having you with us tonight. That does it for the night feed. Don't forget that Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Have a wonderful night. Stay cool. We'll see you tomorrow.